America, a nation of hard-working good-time Charlies, loves to bedeck itself in its glad rags and go places and see things. That's why every year, each section of the country blows off the lid with an extra special event peculiar to its own locale. In New Orleans, it's the colorful annual Mardi Gras. In Indianapolis, it's the death-defying 500-mile auto race. New York City goes plum daffy with its famous New Year's Eve celebration. The Great Northwest stages its yearly rip-roaring rodeo, Ride 'em Cowboy. Atlantic City goes girl crazy as the nation's cuties annually seek the crown of Miss America. And in Hollywood, funny, sunny Hollywood, how do the well-advertised denizens of that glamorous flag stop blow off steam? Here's the answer in precisely three words. Yes, sir, it's Hollywood's night to howl as an important new film is unveiled for the first time. Come along with us backstage, Mr. and Mrs. America. Let's see how these famous nights are created and what makes them tick. Lo and behold, a lonely deserted theater, no glamour here. It's forecourt bare as Mama Hubbard's cupboard. It's gardens yawning with emptiness. No hint here of the big night to come. Then, presto, just like that, things begin to pop. Workmen appear on the scene and begin to dream up some Hollywood glamour. Beautiful statuary gets plastered in a nice sort of way, of course. Up go brilliant arc lights. Out comes decorative foliage. Gardeners help to recreate the fabulous Versailles gardens of King Louis XIV, and trees are especially planted for the occasion. The celebrated Carthay Circle Theater, scene of most of Hollywood's gala premieres, gets its face scrubbed and freshly painted. Right off the forecourt, a circus-type grandstand is started. Things happen fast in Hollywood, and before you can say Jack Robinson, they're completed. And before you can repeat Jack Robinson, they're filled to capacity, although it is hours before the big parade of stars will begin. Radio experts check their sound. Up go loudspeakers to broadcast greetings of the stars to 40,000 assembled fans. Meanwhile, the ballyhoo continues over radio stations. Publicity is pounded out. Newspapers sound the clarion call to Hollywood sightseers. Late afternoon finds the crowd still pouring in. It's the biggest show in town. Hammers ring as workmen rush to complete the job on time. A fairyland of flowers lends a fragrant note. The lovely usherettes are given a last-minute inspection. These gardens are the gardens of Versailles, fabulous and lovely. And the ill-fated queen, reposing serenely upon her pedestal, seems to survey this modern scene with complete approval. So what started as a forsaken theater a scant few hours ago will soon mushroom into a veritable whirlpool of activity. Eight o'clock, Hollywood goes to town. Lights flash, cameras click, music rings out. Action aplenty and fans, thousands of fans from all parts of the country. For this is Californian summertime, the tourist season. Were you there by any chance? Hollywood's version of the Gardens of Versailles, a shambles this morning, tonight are ablaze with brilliance. The Coast to Coast radio show describing the night's events is about to begin. Sir Don Wilson sounds his transcontinental trumpet. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. About us here at the Carthay Circle is a scene of rare spectacle and color, glamour and excitement. 
The sky ablaze with searchlights of every hue, photographers' flashlights popping everywhere, movie cameras grinding, crowds of fans, thousands of them jammed into grandstand bleachers, all surging against ropes stretched along traffic lanes, waiting to catch glimpses of their screen favorites. Soon the long-awaited moment will be at hand. The motion picture premiere, Marie Antoinette, which has been in preparation for nearly four years, will at last reach the screen. The fashionable crowd begins to arrive as Judy Garland and Freddie Bartholomew sign the guest register. Una Merkel stags it. So does handsome Fernand Grave. But not John Barrymore. That's Elaine Berry, his wife. Florence Rice, escorted by Adrian. The crowd sounds a resounding cheer for the co-stars of tonight's premiere, Norma Shearer and Tyrone Power. Happy Norma, we'll say. Popular Spencer Tracy strides toward the broadcasting stand, but baby snooks Fanny Bryce and Pete Smith have beat him to the mic. Uh, I want to see Norma Shear. I told her. You, you, you'll you see her when we go into the theater. That's right. You're going to see Mary Antoinette. <laughs> I don't want to see Mary Antoinette. I want to see Norma Shear. Robert Young and Jimmy Stewart get ready to act as masters of ceremonies and introduce Jeanette McDonald. Good luck to all of you, and bless you, Norma. Still, the stars arrive, the most glittering parade in history. The first lady of the screen has as her guest the first lady of the stage, Helen Hayes. They are flanked by Louis B. Mayer and Tyrone Power. The ecstatic Hedy Lamar arrives with Reginald Gardner, young Fairbanks and Merle Oberon. Paul and Mrs. Mooney. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Boy with director Clarence Brown. Jack Benny and Mary Livingston. Hi, ya buck. Claudette Colbert in a striking gown. That's Simone Simone, or is it Simone Simone? Virginia Bruce and hubby Walter Rubin. Mr. and Mrs. Robert Montgomery. More excitement for the crowd as Carol Lombard and Clark Gable sign the guest register. How'd you autograph hounds like to own this book? Back at the mic, we find Robert Taylor and Barbara Stanwyck. Not that I had seen crowds and excitement at the Lewis Schmeling fight in New York City, but it certainly can't compare with this premiere this evening. I wish to express my sincere congratulations to Miss Norma Shear and Mr. Tyrone Power. Thank you very much, Doctor. Under this dome, 2,000 Hollywood first-nighters pass judgment on the film city's newest big production. Meanwhile, at the entrance of the gardens is tonight's real heroine, the royal bad girl, proud this moment as she was in her own age. The clock moves on. The show is over. The lights dim down. Hollywood again has gone to town. <laughs> 